So I've got a problem with my car here. This is a Toyota Orion, which is very similar to a Camry. This is a 2010 model. And I've got a bit of a problem with my AC system. Well, actually, the whole heater system, really. It basically doesn't work properly. Not straight away. So I'll power this up now. So you've got a flashing light here. I'm going to keep this thing running live so you can see time periods and stuff like that. After a period of time, it'll actually turn on. So it does this every single time. I can actually get it all set up and it all works. Everything works properly. Like once it's actually powered up, it actually works properly. Everything works, the air conditioning works, all the vents work, the you know heating, cooling, um, everything is all working correctly once it turns on. And it's doing this every single time. This only started a few days ago. There we go. It's up. I heard it will wake up. So auto mode. Right, I can set the temperatures, that all works, AC does work, all these other things, they all work. You can turn it off again, turn it back in auto, but there's other interesting things have happened. Now it used to be that when I put it in auto, the AC would turn on at the same time. When I put it on front, the AC would turn on at the same time. Now I believe these are options which are configurable, it seems that it's forgotten those. And interesting now it's holding the front light on even though it's got it turned off hmm. so yes it is kind of working now watch what happens when i turn it off actually i'll put it on auto mode all right so you can see it's running i'll turn it off so it gone and it's gone straight back to doing that so yes i need to figure out what's going on with this i think it's probably the ac amplifier itself I've already checked fuses and that sort of stuff, and they all checked okay. Now, in this car, the fuses are behind the glove box over here, and you have to basically pull the glove box out, which isn't too hard. Actually, you probably can get away with not doing that. It just gives you more access. But you have to go basically underneath. There's a panel underneath, which you have to pull off. It's got clips, four clips on the front. It's got a couple of fingers in the back, which hold the back of it up. You have to pull quite hard on those clips to get them out. They're really stiff, but it just pulls down. It's like a black panel. And then above that, on the left-hand side, there's a black panel which is the fuse box and it's all really tucked away, really hard to access but that's the way I designed it. Anyway, I probed around on those fuses and those fuses were fine. It's not them. So I managed to figure some things out. Passion aside here, as you can see there's a console. I had to pull all the uh, console here out and the actual surround and everything. That's actually fairly easy. Basically there's a bolt there, there's a threaded screw there, there's a few screws across here and you take all those screws out like five of them and once you take in the glove box out you take the whole assembly off and it gives you access to all this stuff obviously you've got to take the bottom panel off as well but that will come with it i think anyway anyway so under here we've got the fan motor and we've got some more electrical stuff here there's the fuse box which i was telling you about before which is literally underneath in the most inaccessible spot possible and right here is the thing we're interested in and that is the AC amplifier right there. So I need to get that out because I'm pretty sure that's what's bad. So this connector here, this big connector, that pin there, that grey with green I think it is, um, goes into that very corner connection right there. That's pin 21 and that is constant power. So that should have 12 volts on there constantly and it does. So that's it which means it must be the module just playing up which is unfortunate. Anyway I've got to try and get this thing out. It's one at the bottom here which is, I think, 10 mil. We're using on these ratcheting spanners. Not much access in here. There you go, there's a screw. Let's take these wires off. This particular one has only got the bottom two connections, the top one's not populated. So now, this has actually got a bit of play in that, but it's still got a bolt up the top here somewhere which I've got to try and get to. I'm not quite sure how I'm going to get to that one because it's tucked right up behind everything in here. And it's a real bugger to get to. Um, I can just touch it with my fingertip right there. I you probably can't even see it, but I'll try to put it back some more. So right there. And my finger is up against it there on the end of the bolt. So it's basically in line there. So trying to get to that is not easy. I might have to drop this console down. I might take those two bolts here off and let this drop to get more access 
I don't want to do that, but um, I might have to. Alright, so I ended up taking those two bolts out there, well those two nuts, and also a bolt from underneath here to let, allow this to drop down, give myself some more room. And then I've got this rubbishy old quarter inch bloody ratchet here with a 10mm socket on it. It's just the right height to get in there now. And I've basically got the screw out, so now I'm just about at the point where I'm going to actually take this module out. But it's a bit of a mission. I don't know how I'm going to get that screw back in again, but uh, I'll worry about that later on. And there you go, there's the module out. In this particular case, it's an 886500-06380. And there's that bracket which has got that bolt which goes behind there, which is really awkward. Anyway, it's out. Now pull this thing apart. Right, so there's the module, and it says it's an 88650-06380 in this particular case. There's different versions of this thing, they all look the same though, but I don't know how much that matters. So anyway, let's get this thing opened up and see if we can see any problems inside. Could this be capacitors or something? It's always a capacitor, isn't it? So it's got these tabs, it's got a seal across it as well, so it shows if you'd opened it up, I think. Oh no, it doesn't, it's just around the side. Interesting. Alright, so let's try and get into that one, and this one, and this one over here, it's going to be a bit trickier. Here we go, I think. Come on, here we go. Just about got it. Right. There's the module, and yes, there are capacitors in there. Right, it's conformally coated mostly, not completely, interestingly. And pop this out. Let's have a close look both sides. There you go, that's that side. Different angles and stuff, in case it matters. And this side. I'll have a close look at this and see if I can find any problems with it. We'll see how lucky I get. Oh, let's do some programming around. I've got a bunch of diodes and stuff. I've had an inspection of an entire board both sides. Visually I couldn't see anything wrong. So it's a case of just probing around I think and seeing what we can find as far as checking things like diodes and what have you. I mean, I'm suspecting it's like a power feed problem. It's just not actually running the power cost through a diode something like that. Or maybe there's... Maybe this inductor here is bad, let's check it side like that. Seems fine. And this is using these little Pomona probes, these are really sharp hard tip probes. Which is basically essential for this because of the conformal coating. Right, that side, nothing obvious apart from that capacitor. More capacitors here. I'm basically looking, these are tantalum caps, right? So there's a half name on that one as well. So tantalum caps are worth checking because they can short. And if they do that, then obviously you're going to have a problem. So I'm going to check this whole board out and I'll come back afterwards. So now I'm going to measure these capacitors. I've already gone around once, so I'm just going to show you again. So that's fine. This one's going to give rude reading because it's got a few capacitors in parallel. So it's showing 140 microfarad because that's 100. There's a 22 and there's another 22 and I believe these are all connected together. So I should get the same reading across all three of those. Yeah. Yep, yeah, so those three there are in parallel. So that kind of makes sense for the capacitance value. That's 20 microfarad, 4.4 ohms, and that's 22 on here. Probably okay, 4.4 ohms is meh. And what's this one here? This is a 1 microfarad, 50 volt, and we're getting 0.8 microfarad at 19 ohms. 
that might be all right although this beats to say no so hmm I'm going to give you some idea here's a through hole version this is a one microfarad 50 volt so it's equivalent hold on let's get it on there there we go one microfarad 2.7 ohms significantly lower I wonder if I should change that capacitor it's looking suspicious so these two capacitors here they've got no polarity markings on them so I believe these are non-polarized electrolytic capacitors and I don't have any non-polarized capacitors now this one here tests with 19 ohms resistance so I'm suspicious this one here is bad this one's 4 ohms which is getting up there a little bit but because they're non-polarized that may also mean the reading is going to be slightly higher anyway and I don't have any replacements now I believe one thing you can do is actually put two capacitors back to back to effectively make it non-polarized so if you put a negative say this side join the two positives together and put the other negative that side that would make it non-polarized because it would be responsive in both directions I don't like to do that though I don't think that's a really good thing to do but I think it can be done I've never had to resort to doing that but I believe it's something you can do in a push I'm reluctant to change it because I'm not sure it's wrong it seems wrong but I could probably get some parts and get some non polarized caps in like a one microfarad 50 volt when it's a 22 microfarad 16 volt I could get some of these in and um, swap them out once I get the parts but that could take a couple of weeks or a few weeks or a couple of months the way things are these days so I might do that anyway but without definitely knowing what's going on I'm reluctant I can't find any faults on this board I've looked around I probe just about everything there's no shorter capacitors there's no leaky things there's no open or shorted diodes there's no open or shorted transistors the ICs appear to be not shorted parallels look like they're not shorted um, there's an inductor up here which is not open so kind of puzzled about what's going on with this thing because I can't actually find anything physically wrong with it now the only thing that is suspicious as is always suspicious with these lead free bloody products I'm sure it's lead free is the soldering so we've got the big connector here and it was the pins this end we want and if I look really closely I'm not completely sure that these joints are perfect it's a bit hard to see on camera it's as close as I can and they look kind of okay but at certain angles you can see a very slight ring so it makes me suspicious that maybe the solder joints aren't the best and maybe all it comes back to is dodgy solder joints because mechanical stress is always a potential issue right so that's always one of the things I would normally look at anyway and in fact that was one of the first things I looked at when I first opened this up was checking these pins out to see if I could see an obvious break there's nothing particularly obvious I mean even though it's got these screws actually holding down to the ball there's always going to be a little bit of vibration and, and things like that through it so it could well be that there's a, a weak joint which is still connecting but it's got a slight resistance and that's potentially causing a voltage drop maybe but I mean I measured from the pin to the ball and it seemed okay but it could be that I've disturbed it now I mean the other aspect of this is that I'm not even sure it's this module which is the problem this module works in conjunction with the actual dashboard control everything seems to be pointing to this module but it could be the dashboard control is causing problems as well I mean it's maybe that's what's wrong is the other end of the unit and it's not communicating properly and it's messing this up or causing this to reset or something or causing it to crash, I don't know, I don't know. Um, it seems to be pointing to this because I believe the memory of what's going on is stored on this I and mean, it could be in the actual control on the dashboard but I think the memory of the settings are stored in this part because this is where the constant power goes to the dashboard control doesn't have constant power, it's only got ignition power I'm going to resolve the leaves and then we'll try it again I suppose alright, it's back together, let's go and put it back in the car and see if it works I'll let you know. So I plugged the module in, tried it out, no different. So hmm, I could potentially go in there and hook up as an oscilloscope and check the communication between the dashboard controller and that module because it uses the LIN protocol, which I know nothing about, never dealt with it, but it uses LIN communication. So I know I do have scopes here which have got that communication protocol built into them. 
So I could potentially hook up a scope and actually check for communication between the two units and try and determine when they're trying to communicate and that sort of stuff and which direction it's going in maybe, I don't know. Yeah, I, I'm more inclined to buy another module and drop it in and see if it fixes it because I'm suspecting it's the module. That's where I'm sort of 90% heady at. 90% is that module which I display with and 10% for the dashboard control. Could be either way, of course, but uh, yeah. One eternity later. So, the issue I've been having, as I said, is this front indicator flashing. Now, what I actually think that means is that one of these server motors are bad. And I actually think it might be this one. I'm going to plug it in now and test it. I've already obviously removed it from the car. I'm going to show you where it came from. It comes from behind here. Remember where I did the uh, AC amplifier, which is right there? There's the AC amplifier. Well, right over here is where this thing mounts. So up over here, next to the fan motor, there's a gap right here. And you can see there's gear just there. This engages with that and it sits up here. Right? And there's the wire which plugs into it just here. So I'm going to plug this wire in and see if it actually moves when I change it, tell it to uh, do a different airflow. Right, let's try this. Stick on dual mode and rotate. That's maximum cooling, maximum heating, nothing has moved. Okay, let's try different modes in case it's doing something different than what I think it is. Different modes. No, so I haven't actually seen this thing moving at all. So I think this one is completely dead. I've not been able to get it to work at all. But to stick it on single mode, so it's trying to control the left side and the right side at the same time because it's got independent heating and cooling on each side. And uh, all the way up, all the way down, nah, nothing. Just dead. So the issue I also had is that it's not been cooling very well. And with this thing all the way up like that, which is where it's sitting before, that's actually heating the air coming out. So what's happening is I've been heating on this side and cooling the other side, which is why the car's not actually been cooling that well inside the cabin. Because this has been on heat, not cool. So I just unplugged the driver's side one, plugged this motor in here, tried different settings, it's still not moving. Which means I know it's not the amplifier, which is what I thought it was originally, it must be the servo motor. So let's have a look at this motor here. So this is an AE0638001 PLS. So this is from a Toyota. This is using lots of different Toyotas. You'll see the same motor in lots of them. What you might find is a different fitting on here. They've got different gears, you've got lever arms, stuff like that. But it's all the same motor assembly, let's click on a different gear. So this particular one is from the passenger side hot cold air mixture valve. So this controls the temperature coming out of the passenger side of the car. Now, in my case, this is a right-hand drive car, so this is on the left-hand side of the vehicle. But the same motor is used in all of them. All of the motors are the same. They've got different attachments on them. Anyway, I've taken this one out because it's definitely not operating. So I thought we'd pull it apart and have a look and see what's going on. But before I do that, I've done a couple of things. I've marked where this position is in case it matters. Right? So I put a little scratch mark on here so I know where it's actually where it's positioned. Excuse my catch is a bit senile which is 19 now. And we've got five pins in this one, it's different versions. You've got three pin ones, which have got uh, CAN bus kind of communication on, or some kind of bus communication, I'm assuming it's CAN bus. And then you've got this type, which is a basically a potentiometer with a motor control. I think we need to get a CAT scan. What do you think, Paul? Is it broken? Now we've got CAT here everywhere. Anyway, I don't know which pin's which on this thing. Of course I can figure out when I open it up, but let's measure it and see if we can find anything here. So it isn't moving, which means I'm suspecting it's a motor control problem. I've already verified it's not the control system itself, because I plugged this into a different port on a control system, and it still didn't move. This is a bit awkward to probe, I think. Anyway, just try and get a pin on that one, and a pin on this one. What do we get? 0.2 ohms, okay. That one, and that one. Nothing. And there. Nothing. There and there. Nothing. Mm-hmm. 
I'll put some overlays up about how this works. Basically it works the same way as rotary encoder, it's got different pulses, it puts out pulses as it turns and it counts the pulses so it knows where it is. Also a bit like a step motor I suppose, but in that way, but no, it's not. It's, it's not controlled in steps, it's, it's got a pulse output. So there will be, that shorted one will be one of the control lines and there's another one there. So somewhere in here is a motor control line, I don't know which one it is. I can't tell from this. Let's open it up. Let's see, I think I'll try and hold them at the same time. Bit popping shut again. Oh, that one just broke. That's not a good sign. There's a latch there. There's a latch there. There's a latch here. Come on. Pop open. It's probably a more illegal way of doing this. So, this is broken. I've already ordered some brand new ones. In the suspicion that it's going to be one of these. So, I've actually already got a backup plan if this doesn't work. Um, so, I would be nice to fix it, but uh, I've got brand new ones coming. Yeah, that's broken as well. Right, well, that's it. Let's open now. Put that top off. There's the motor control. There's the gears. There's some old grease in there. So, it's basically a motor, and this pulled us apart here. I don't think any of this is really going to matter too much, apart from the actual rotary encoder itself. That I might have to take off here. Okay, let's pop this off here. And get in there. There we go. Got something happening. This is about done with a break because I might have to transfer this onto a new motor when it arrives. Okay, so this will now pull out. Here we go. So there's all the rotary encoder section. Alright, so that's what a rotary encoder basically looks like. As you can see, this is rather dirty. Um, this could use a good clean, but it's intact. Yep, yeah, it's not worn through, it's just dirty. Alright, that's fine. Right, so it wasn't even moving, so I don't think it's a sensing problem, I think it's just the motor control's bad, the motor's probably fired itself. And so these are the pickups here, that's what send the pulses through. So it's going off this pin, this one, and this one. So these two end pins here look like the motor control ones, these two here. So they're very two left ones. Probably pin one and two, I'm guessing actually. Those are intact. That doesn't look too bad. Motor does not turn, so can I? Is this just a push connection? It is just a bloody push connection. Look at that. It just sits in there. Motor is not seized. Okay, so it just sits in there. Maybe it's just a bad motor connection. Is it going to be that easy? Okay, well, let's measure across the motor. Now, I'm pretty sure I measured across those two pins before. I'm just going to look at this myself. That's showing open. There's nothing there. Give it a spin. Still showing as open. That motor has gone open circuit. That's what's wrong. So I've replaced that motor now. So it's all brand new. Well, it's not actually new. The ones that arrived weren't new. They were used ones. Anyway. It now works every time. Still got the issue there with the uh, aircon and stuff, it doesn't come on automatically when you get it auto. Obviously it needs reprogramming. I don't know how to program that. If you know how to program that, please comment down below and I'll pin it. Make it a pin comment. So if you know how to program these things, so you can adjust it, so when you get auto it turns the air conditioning on, or if you go to front it turns the air conditioning on. Put it down below so I can learn how to do it, and everybody else can too. Catch you later.